I want to the co-creative rubrics prioritizing transparency, equity, and relevance in course assessment. I am very excited that you're here today to learn more about rubrics as a way to reimagine how we do assessment. Before we start, I'd like to introduce myself and share a glimpse of my background. My name is Lina Eskew. I am the Assistant Director of Equitable Assessment with the Searle Center for Learning and Teaching at Northwestern University. My pronouns are she and her. I began my journey in higher education as an institutional researcher. Over the years, I've transitioned between roles in evaluation and assessment and have been fortunate to teach diverse groups of students. Throughout my career, the common thread has been my focus on student equity and the use of data to uncover educational gaps. Now I'm curious to know how you feel about rubrics right now. Take a moment to think through the four options presented here. Feel free to pause the video and then select the choice that best represents your sentiments about rubrics. Thank you for reflecting how you feel about rubrics. My goal with this session is that you feel empowered about using rubrics when appropriate and also have a few other learning objectives for this session. The first one is that you'll be able to recognize limitations of traditional rubrics. Then, to be able to impact the process of rubric design and co-creation to prioritize transparency and equity. Third, that you'll be able to reflect on how the concept of co-creative rubrics can be infused into the learning and teaching context. According to the research by the Illinois Initiative on Transparency and Teaching, there is a relationship between transparent design and student success. According to this research, students experience greater confidence and self-efficacy when they know what is expected and are able to recognize when they need help in their learning. This also ties to research on metacognition and students' ability to be aware of their learning and become active participants of the learning process. Research on cultural responsive assessment by Burns, Longgreen, and Becky in 2020 defined culturally responsive assessment as one, including students in the assessment process, two, reconceptualizing assessment, three, examining equity in the classroom, and four, increasing transparency and accessibility. Faculty can be more culturally responsive when they intentionally involve students in the assessment process. So let's continue to contextualize assessment. In general, there are two types of assessment as defined by purpose. Formative assessment is typically low stakes, guided by our aim to learn and understand what students have learned. It also serves as a diagnostic tool for us to identify where to make improvements based on feedback in a collaboration process between the student and the instructor. Summative assessment, on the other hand, is high stakes, also guided by the goal of understanding what students have learned but typically in a more evaluative way, where often there is no time or space for feedback or to make improvements. So what are rubrics? A rubric is a traditionally, is traditionally a scoring guide that assesses student learning through specific criteria and performance levels. An equity-minded approach to rubrics enables students to be included in the design process, transforming transforming rubrics into clear, inclusive, and powerful tools for formative assessment. Rubrics can be classified into two major types, analytical and holistic. An analytical rubric is an assessment method that uses specific criteria consistent of components, scriptures, and expectations, also known as levels of performance, for an assignment or project. A holistic rubric evaluates the assignment or work as a complete piece and then assigns a single score based on the overall assess assessment. This one tends to be a bit more quick and subjective. The difference between the two lies in the feedback, 
process. When the analytical rubric is focused on helping the student improve by providing detailed feedback. And the holistic rubric does not follow a feedback loop. And so this is one of the reasons why analytical rubrics in particular are often viewed and perceived as invaluable for formative assessment where instructors create opportunities to provide feedback and consequently improve student learning. The rubric here exemplifies the components of an analytical rubric, which are the first column to the left is um, the dimension or criteria. Uh, this is the y-axis and then across or the x-axis are the performance levels. In between, you'll see the descriptors for each of those performance levels. I'd like to share a great, great, great resource when creating rubrics for your classroom or program. The value of rubrics for AACNU were developed by teams of faculty experts from diverse higher education institutions across the United States. They serve as a reliable tool for assessing learning across 16 different learning topical areas. The website for these value rubrics is noted here. Please check them out. I often have used them as a starting point in my rubric design process. There are so many wonderful things about creating and implementing rubrics, but also I want to highlight some of the limitations of traditional rubrics, which it can be very mechanistic in efforts to achieve objectivity and efficiency. They could fail to capture the complexity of student learning and they could provide a prescribed notion of excellence. Co-creating rubrics in a way addresses many of these limitations for traditional rubrics because rubrics then become flexible and relevant. They are part of a joint effort between students and instructors to design and when appropriate, apply rubrics to assignments. Some of the key benefits are increased student engagement and voice, increased transparency and understanding, increased relevance in course material, increased in skill development, by applying higher order learning and metacognition skills. So let's talk about the how to go about rubric co-creation. I have operationalized this practice into three different approaches. The first one is feedback refined rubric which uses an existing rubric, uh, and then this rubric gets op optimized by student feedback. This approach is recommended as a starting point. The second is col collaborative scaling, which reflects the collaboration between the instructor and the students in developing performance levels. Indicators, you know, the descriptors that we saw in one of the previous slides, while the foundational criteria or KSAs, which are the knowledge, skills, and attitudes are defined by the instructor and not the student. Comprehensive co-design, as the name applies, it's an all-encompassing involvement of both students and instructors in designing the entire rubric. The instructor then will need to share the assignment's purpose and its alignment to the course learning outcomes for this process to be effective. As I mentioned the limitations of traditional rubrics, I also want to quickly note that when thinking about co-creating rubrics, you should definitely think about whether this practice is both feasible and manageable. Some questions to think about are, how realistic is for me to co-create rubrics based on my class size? If you have a large class, for example, you might think that this is not feasible. However, you may be able to accomplish this if you are willing to do some experimentation. For example, you could devise a quick survey where you ask, where you ask your students on your already established rubric, and if you're interested in learning whether the language that you have already put together is accessible. Other considerations are whether you have the time to go through this process and or the flexibility to change or create new rubrics if your course is part of a standardized accreditation process. Sometimes courses 
that are associated with programmatic accreditation have um, no room for negotiation when it comes to changing or, or creating new rubrics. While co-creating rubrics might seem like a new practice, there are many faculty right now who are experimenting with this and finding very positive results in student learning, as well as getting positive feedback on student experiences with this process. As a member of the Soul Center, I am privileged to learn about all the innovations taking place in the classrooms. But I do want to point you to a specific one that was presented at the 2023 TeachX conference here at Northwestern, where inclusion, equity, and student experiences were the central themes. In this specific session on co-creating rubrics, in a specific engineering course, two faculty members explained their process of rubric co-creation and the positive impact of this process on content mastery, student skills, and experiences. Similar to this example, as mentioned, uh, as mentioned any other faculty members are experimenting and finding many positive results. To end this session, I'd like to pause and have a moment for us to do a reflection. While this is a quick reflection, I encourage you to keep, continue to think about ways that you can engage your students in the assessment process to bring more transparency, relevancy, and equity into student learning. Whether you start small by asking for feedback on the language used in your assessments, or you go big by engaging students in the development of learning outcomes, the important first step is to start by inviting your students into this conversation. Thank you so much for engaging in this session. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me via email. Thank you.